The Hunchback of Notre Dame is perhaps best known in the form of the 1996 Disney musical animated movie. The version presented there tells a much brighter story than the original 1831 novel of the same name by Victor Hugo. Yet the 2015 musical combines the two in a way that retains the familiar tunes found in the Disney movie while incorporating much darker themes and allowing for the full breadth of Hugo's novel to be covered in greater detail. The stage adaptation touches on topics such as love, death, human morality, abuse of power, obsession, disability, and revolution. From Esmeralda to Phoebus, Quasimodo to Frollo, each character is shown to grow and react and simply act human in a remarkably natural way. Yet one character stands out from among the rest in how he perfectly displays the human tendencies to lust after power, control his fellow brothers, and advance himself. Not only does he show these characteristics in a human and understandable way, but he also proves to be the catalyst for nearly all the story's action and events. That's right, Lieutenant Frederick Charles is the mastermind behind all that occurs over the course of the musical. Our first introduction to this devil among men comes during the Feast of Fools, Frederick is called in to arrest the gypsy that Captain Phoebus had caught and detained. This unassuming gypsy will actually play an important role throughout the story as Frederick's key informant. It's heavily implied that since he shows up later in the story, the traitor must have been released by Frederick, as escape would have been nigh impossible for under his watchful eye, and the only plausible reason for his release would be that he was forced to become a double agent and spy on the gypsies for purposes known only to Frederick. As the Feast of Fools progresses further, the townspeople revel and appreciate the dancing performance put on by Esmeralda in the square, but none enjoy it more so than Frollo, Phoebus, and Quasimodo. Though the others in the crowd may cheer and holler for the gypsy, it's clear to see that those three are enjoying her performance far more than the rest, and most importantly, Frederick seems to notice this as well. After all, he's right next to his new captain, as well as his liege, the Archdeacon, and he must have glimpsed the darkened figure in the alley as Quasimodo, with the unmistakable hunched back and familiar tattered cloak. Frederick's perception of these three as they become attracted to Esmeralda starts the beginnings of a plan in his mind, yet he cannot muse for long as a riot begins to break out among the people of Paris. After Quasimodo's brutal harrowing by the frenzied crowd, we see Frederick and Phoebus chatting in the background about something unspecified. Yet considering the events that just passed, their topic of choice is obvious. Esmeralda. After all, they just watched her unforgettable dance, and to see her stand up for someone as outcast as Quasimodo, against the will of the crowd, must have been utterly shocking. It's at this point Frederick might be planting the seed in Phoebus's mind to keep thinking about Esmeralda, and it's here that we can see the flame flicker to life inside of him, thanks to Frederick's encouragement. In the middle of this conversation, the two soldiers are instructed to bring the shaken Quasimodo back to the bell tower. This is where Frederick gets a little crafty. He saw the compassion shown by the gypsy girl to Quasimodo, and it's likely she's going to want to check up on him. So he takes a slow, easy-to-follow route back to the cathedral, anticipating she'll be trailing behind them. Lo and behold, who shows up but Esmeralda? Frollo obviously comes to see what the commotion could be, and Frederick has conveniently taken the other two interested parties to the bell tower, away from them. This is just part of his overall plan to further infatuate Frollo with Esmeralda, and it proves very effective. After Frollo's departure for Mass, Frederick leads Phoebus to her, with the same general idea in mind. It's also foreseeable that Phoebus will want a little time alone with her, so Frederick heads out, leaving him to further become attracted to Esmeralda. Phoebus ends up learning a little more about her past, but is interrupted by Quasimodo from nearby. Esmeralda follows him to the top of the bell tower, and is fascinated by the sights of the beautiful city below. Quasimodo is more entranced by Esmeralda herself, and it's clear that he's becoming more smitten with her the more she talks to him. Frederick makes sure to leave enough time for Quasimodo to fall more deeply for her before he leads Frollo back up and kills the mood. This exposure again to Esmeralda results in Frollo being overcome with more thoughts of her, even as he orders her out of the cathedral. His obsession with her leads to nightly prowls of the streets of Paris, looking for her and feeding his unhealthy lust. This wandering is mostly aimless until Frederick gives it some direction. Some weeks after the men's encounters with Esmeralda, Frederick asks his comrade Phoebus if they can have a night out for a little rest and recreation at a nearby tavern he's familiar with. Phoebus agrees, but unknown to him, Frederick's sources have let him know that Esmeralda will be there on that night. So not only is Frederick leading Phoebus to her for a fun night at the tavern, he's also sure that Frollo will follow them to the raccuous scene, 
hoping to catch a glimpse of the elusive Esmeralda. All of his plans come true with a vengeance, as Esmeralda dances with Phoebus, tickling his fancy and enchanting him further. All the while, Frollo watches from above and is bewitched again by her swaying choreography, leading him to desire her as forbidden fruit. Frederick knows his liege well. After all, he's been stationed at the cathedral for some time, serving him and protecting the church. It's safe to say that he's seen Frollo exert his power in order to get what he wanted various times. So while Frederick couldn't predict exactly what Frollo would do to find Esmeralda, he can make a pretty good guess what it'll look like. A citywide hunt for the gypsy. Now, while Frederick obviously knows where she is already, both through the traitor and through previous visits to the brothel with Phoebus, Frederick can't let it be known exactly how well informed he is. In order to indirectly receive word of where the gypsy is, without saying it himself, Frederick pays off a townsperson to parrot back the location he tells them, thus keeping his extensive knowledge of Paris's goings-on a secret. As they're led to the brothel, Frederick has one more ace up his sleeve. He knows that Frollo's reaction to his desire for Esmeralda is to destroy her completely, while Phoebus simply wants to love her and live life with her. And it's because of this contrast in personalities that Frederick is able to finally get what he wants. Frollo orders Phoebus to essentially kill Esmeralda, which cannot rest on his conscience lightly. He's so smitten with the gypsy at this point that he disobeys a direct order and refuses to do so. Because of this, Phoebus is demoted, and Frederick is made captain of the guard. Lieutenant, you would have a charge. Arrest Captain Phoebus. The payoff to Frederick is finally seen, and some might count this as the finale of his hard work to advance and become more powerful. Yet, this isn't nearly the end of his meddling in the lives of others. As a soldier for many years and the somewhat quiet position of cathedral guard, Frederick must have had plenty of off time to sharpen his sword fighting skills. Thus, it's entirely possible for him to duel Phoebus without injury to either one of them, mostly due to his need for Phoebus later in his master plans. He and the gypsy make their escape, leaving Frollo to deal with his increased bewitchment to Esmeralda. As we move on to the second half of the show, we must ask an important question. How does a rigorously trained soldier, newly promoted to captain of the guard, who is intimately familiar with the cathedral he's been stationed at for years, let the city's two most wanted fugitives in, one of whom is heavily handicapped, along with another gypsy? The answer? Frederick let them in. He knew that Esmeralda would search for sanctuary, and the best place would be the cathedral. And Frederick knows that letting Esmeralda into the cathedral will further infatuate Quasimodo as well, setting up the bizarre love triangle more completely. While Quasimodo and Phoebus assess their situation, Frederick devises a little plan of his own to lead Frollo to the gypsy hideaway. Frederick already knows the position of the Court of Miracles, thanks to his insider information. But again, he must hide his knowledge so as not to raise suspicion about his intellect. As Frollo is in the bell tower investigating Quasimodo, Frederick informs him that they've located where the gypsies are hiding. Upon leaving the tower, he actually tells him he doesn't know where they are, but that Quasimodo should, and they can follow him there. So as the hunchback and soldier set out to find the Court of Miracles, Frollo and Frederick follow closely behind. The most perceptive of you might notice something else about this pursuit. There's a strange character watching from among the streets of Paris. One who looks oddly... familiar. Don't forget him. After their following of Quasimodo to the Court of Miracles, Frollo and Frederick suddenly storm the hideout. Frederick has once again succeeded in bringing the conflicting parties all together again, leading to a heightened tension between them all. Yet it seems Frederick isn't staying vigilant, as a group of gypsies, including the King Clopin, escapes from right under his nose. But when inspected in closer detail, it can be seen that the traitor gypsy has also escaped with him. Hmm. Interesting. Anyway, Frederick brings the hunchback and prisoners back to the cathedral with him. After listening in on Frollo's time spent with Esmeralda in her cell, Frederick knows that it's time to end things in a big way. He brings in Phoebus, and only lets the two lovers talk together for barely a minute. Yet, pay attention to this exchange closely, as it's the turning point of the entire show. You must go. Frederick. Oh, my, my friend, couldn't you, um, if I offered you a little, I'd just Captain. I'll be back in time. We have so little time left to say goodbye. 
So let's say it while we have the chance. Did you catch that? Let me explain. Before Frederick came in, the two prisoners were mostly undecided on what to do, and would very likely have given up their comfort for each other. Esmeralda would have given herself to Frollo so Phoebus could be free. Yet Frederick is beginning to learn about them, and he can see that they're two strong-willed, independent people. If he leaves them together through the night, he can see that they'll resist the plans of Frollo and choose their own paths. By allowing them a longer goodbye, Frederick has effectively ensured their deaths will come in the morning. After all this time in preparation, Frederick is finally reaching his endgame. We'll reveal what's going on so far. Quasimodo has been locked up in the bell tower and is still desperate for Esmeralda's affection. Phoebus and Esmeralda are imprisoned together, resolute in their choice to die as independent souls, but still thinking of some way to save the other. Frollo is resting easy in the knowledge that he will either control or destroy Esmeralda. What could come of this situation? Now, Frederick is smart. He has to think ahead and look at the possible outcomes of the situation he's in. Quasimodo is the only one in a position to act, and it's likely he's going to try to make a break for it and rescue Esmeralda from her pyre, as she's the only girl who's ever shown him any sort of affection. He'll likely bring her to the only sanctuary he knows as well, the bell tower. But that won't cause enough commotion to really stir up the soldiers. No, Phoebus is still on the pyre. So what can Frederick do to release his former comrade? Not much by himself, but since he has a gypsy traitor right next to the ear of King Clopin, he can influence the King of Gypsies into setting Phoebus free. They predictably will rally the people to fight back against Frollo's might, forcing the soldiers to push harder into the cathedral in an attempt to flee the crowds and regain control of Esmeralda. Quasimodo, however, is still on top of his game here, and moves to the last resort, hot lead. Frederick knew this might be coming, but really, there's no escaping it. The soldiers are burned alive by the hot lead. Even as Frederick's prediction of Frollo's demise by Quasimodo comes true, he's not there to revel in his plan's fruition. Or is he? Let's rewind a little bit to this fellow on the street. He certainly bears an oddly similar resemblance to the Frederick we know and love, right? It seems Frederick thought so as well. And what man in their right mind would deny the opportunity to play at captain of a guard for a day, especially when paid off by Frederick himself? That's right. The doppelganger of Frederick, or anti-Frederick, is paid to perform Frederick's duties as a military officer on the day of the burnings. Frederick wasn't certain if anything catastrophic might happen to him, as he would eventually storm the cathedral, but he took no chances, as Anti-Frederick did all the grunt work instead. So, as Anti-Frederick perished in the molten lead raining down, the true Frederick lived on, and with no one standing in his way, he finally achieved his true goal. Frollo was out for the count, Quasimodo was deformed and scared the people of Paris, Esmeralda was dead, and Phoebus was outcasted, leaving only Frederick as the next possible choice. That's right. Welcome your new archdeacon, Frederick.